So hey everybody, it's Professor Dominic, and uh, I have been having technical difficulties today. It's been so much fun. Um, basically, I've discovered that when I am teaching from home that um, my husband and I have a hard time with both of us using the Wi-Fi. So, um, so that's no good for me, but um, hopefully this will work better. Um, basically, I'm going to just record today what I was going to tell you, and you can access it whenever you wish. So I had started talking on Monday a little bit about the fact that Egypt and the kingdom of Cush or Nubia were closely linked to one another and that it's not really mentioned in art history textbooks and it's definitely not mentioned in your art history textbook. And those of you who are in my African art class, um, bear with me because this is going to be a very similar discussion to what I said in African art the other day. So, uh, but th what will be happening with this is I'm going to have uh, an assignment around chapters two and chapters three, chapters two and three, and I will be posting that later today as well. So check back on D2L for that information. So Cush and Kemet were the names that Egypt and Nubia gave to themselves. We know them today as Egypt and Nubia. So Egypt was Kemet, Cush was Nubia. And I think I started talking a little bit about um, Kush, maybe I can't remember, on Monday if I did not. Um, what you're looking at is a scene from the city of Kerma. This is the um, remains of a holy temple in, uh, in the city of Kerma known as a Defufa. That's what... Um, this thing is here that you're saying. Let me see if I can get my, oops, so I'm supposed to have a laser pointer with this gizmo. Where is that laser pointer? Why can't I see it? I don't know. All right. Well, that's meh. All right. So uh -huh. we'll just keep talking. I'll just keep talking. So the Defufa is that big structure that looks kind of like a termite mound. Um, it's been desertified, worn down by the sands of the desert. It probably looked a lot more, a lot differently back in the day, but this was around um, the period of, uh, let me go back here to my timeline. So the Defufa is about current with um, 2000 BC and about the Middle Kingdom in ancient Egypt. So just to give you an idea. And the all of the remains around here, these are the walls that remain of the ancient temple that would have been in front of um, the Defufa. We're not really sure what the Defufa was for. It seems to have been um, more of a religious edifice than a palace, um, but we don't know. There is the burial of a king nearby. Um, just one of those really interesting things. So this is a timeline that kind of shows you what was going on with Egypt and Rome at the same time of everything that was going on with ancient um, Nubia. So uh, Kerma and the C group culture, as it's known, were overwhelmed around 1500 BC. That was a period when um, Egypt at the beginning of the New Kingdom conquered Nubia as far south as the fourth cataract of the Nile. And then with the waning of Egyptian power at the end of the New Kingdom, we have the rise of a, a completely Nubian dynasty of leadership, the 25th dynasty. And so the Nubians for about a hundred years um, controlled Egypt. And we'll take a look at that. So what you're looking at here is what was considered to be the kingdom of Kush during 700 BC. And so this was a period of time when um, Egypt and Nubia were united as one. Uh, all up and down the River Nile, and this shows you where all the little cataracts are and how far south everything is. And this red line shows you um, what had been all of Egypt 
during the New Kingdom. And basically between the New Kingdom and the Late Kingdom, um, other people came in and conquered Egypt and were ruling it. And also the kings of the Late period felt very much that Egypt had fallen into um, decrepitude and had degenerated and that it was important for them to come in and revive true Egyptian culture. They felt that they were the true um, uh, descendants of the gods and that the gods had said you got to go and clean everything up there so they basically synthesized in their own lands uh, both Nubian and Egyptian elements so they reflect the centuries of the Egyptian presence in Nubia and the heritage from the city of Kerma and they moved from Kerma to a new capital, to Napata, and they started building pyramidal tombs there. And what you'll notice, these tombs uh, are much more narrow. They have a much more narrow slope. They are actually more of iso isosceles triangles than, um, than equilateral triangles. And they're also smaller. But what's interesting is the Nubians really, really loved uh, the shape of the pyramid. And they have over 200 of them built there. And there's only about 80 that we know of in Egypt. So pretty interesting. So in the 8th century BCE, the Kushite kings responded to a period of divided rule in Kemet by marching northward and unifying it. So as I said, this is Dynasty 25 of Egypt, and this ushers in the late period or the late kingdom of Egyptian history. And as rulers of Egypt, the Kushites did not consider themselves to be alien overlords. As I said, they felt that they had the divine favor of the gods of Kemet and that they were taking over degenerate Egypt and restoring everything to the way it was supposed to be. And on this slide, these are the Shabtis of the pharaoh Taharqa. He was... Um, I think the second ruler of um, the United Kingdoms of Egypt and Nubia. And the purpose of a Shabti, they were basically little um, miniature statues of the king. And if the gods called on the king to work in the afterlife, the Shabtis were supposed to come to life and do the work for him. So let's go to the next. So the rulers of Akush honored Amun initially. We'll see a shift in that a little bit later. But initially they honored Amun, who was the solar deity of Waset or Thebes, because they built, believed that his true home was here in this mountain near Napata. And this became known by its Arabic name Jebel Barkal, which means mountain of holiness. And what you're looking at is what would have been the entrance. And there would have been um, a whole sort of um, just like with the pyramids, there had been um, walkways uh, leading from the temples to the pyramids and then colossal statues on either side. We have sphinxes on either side here and then we have an artist reconstruction in the next slide of what it would have looked not this slide but the next slide after this of what it would have looked like but the foundations have survived and that gives us an idea of what it might have looked like at its height so this is what's known as the Beckonet or pylon temple and that's essentially a trapezoidal shaped um, temple uh, one on the left one on the right with an entranceway and then a place to hold poles for banners and then over here this outcropping of rock um, hard to believe but it's supposed to look like a cobra striking and the cobra wearing um, the crowns of upper and lower Egypt so you have to use your imagination a little bit but um, that's what they felt was the symbol to show them this is the true home of the god Amun. So here's another uh, view of it. And what differentiates the way that they angle this pylon or beckonet temple is that in uh, Egypt, in the New Kingdom, it would face east so that uh, the open space, this little space right here, um, 
above the portal and between the towers would frame the rising sun. So here instead, it's facing east to be, you know, the framework for the whole entrance to the mountain itself. And then when you go inside there and underground, there's a whole amazing temple with cave paintings and not cave paintings, temple paintings, wall paintings, the whole nine. So these are uh, also this. These would have had. These would have also lined uh, the side of um, the walkway, and these would have been colossal statues of the pharaoh or the king. And what you will notice here. So the um, they have a slightly different shape to the crown. It's much, much more closely worn to the head. And instead of a vulture and a cobra to show upper and lower Egypt, instead here now there's two cobras to show the unification of Egypt and Nubia. And as you can see, some of them are still wearing the crowns of upper and lower Egypt. And some of them are just wearing, which would have had the two cobras as well. Um, but they're all in the pharaonic pose, you know, that very rigid pose with their arms at their sides, clenched in fists. And what's also interesting is this was probably from later times. Somebody was very threatened by the fact that Nubia had come in and taken over because these were found um, in kind of a hole that was uncovered by archaeologists with their heads cut off. So interesting. So then a causeway that leads to the entrance of the temple was flanked by stone sculptures of rams. As I said, again, rams and cobras would represent Amun. And there again, you can see that little outcropping of rock that is supposed to look like a cobra striking. As I said, use your imagination. So this is... Um, another sphinx and this one is the sphinx of the ruler Taharqa and uh, again he's wearing the double cobra so there is that and then here is a ram sphinx and he is cradling a statue of Taharqa as well. So after ruling in uh, Egypt for a little over a century, uh, kings then arose in Kemet to form new dynasties, and actually we enter into um, the Greco-Roman period of Egypt, which is a whole other thing where Alexander the Great's armies had swept in and um, installed the Ptolemies to rule Egypt, and Cleopatra was the last pharaoh of Egypt before the um, Roman Empire came in. So anyway, uh, warriors from Western Asia um, invaded the Nile Valley on two separate occasions, um, and with that, the Nubians moved south to the city of Meroe, and so this marks the shift from the Napatan phase to the Meroitic phase of Kush, or Nubia. And they were also buried at Meroe, the rulers were, rather than at Napata. And again, you have all of these amazing pyramids um, in the Sudan, in the desert in the Sudan. Um, and they ruled for um, almost a thousand years after that. So the pyramids here um, attest to the rich history. And they're quite a bit smaller than the Old Kingdom tombs. But again, there are more of them. And as I mentioned, they have isosceles triangle shape rather than um, the equilateral triangle. And you'll notice they all have these little beckonet or pylon temples sitting in front of them. So this is a temple that uh, is attached to each tomb and that marks the last point of contact between the living and the dead. And then this is one of the most important tombs. This is the tomb of Amana Shaketo. And this is an illustration from the 19th century because unfortunately not long after this, um, an Italian explorer came in and blew the pyramid up, which is of course bad archeology. span And this was before, you know, we had laws about these things. You know, people thought they could just go into a foreign country and just do whatever the heck they wanted, but no longer the case. But anyway, he blew up the pyramid. Um, in spite of that, there are many things that remain from Amana Shaketo's tomb, uh, including this is a little shard that shows her face. 
And then this is a thing, a little weird thing known as a um, a shield ring. And we'll see one on, in the next slide. What I want you to notice is here is a ram's head, again, for Amun. You've got two winged goddesses on either side. Uh, these goddesses are wearing the headdress of Upper and Lower Egypt. They may well represent Isis and Nephthys. Um, they might also represent Mut, who was Amun's wife. And then Amun himself is wearing an ostrich feather crown. It would have had two large ostrich feathers. And then he's got the solar disk with the rearing cobra on it. And then this is another shield ring, which again is very... So what's interesting is all of these things um, that you see here, you've got a row of cobras, you've got the pylon temple, you've got the solar disk, you've got the ram's head, you've got the jeweled um, sort of uh necklace that egyptian rulers would have worn but nobody had put these items together in this way until nubia and there's a little ring on the back so that also tells us that it might have been worn as a ring but we don't really know for sure so there's that so what i want to show you though that i'm excited about is you know you hear talk of Nubian queens, Nubian queens. Oh, she's such a Nubian queen. Well, there really were Nubian queens and they were very important. And unlike Egyptian queens, Nubian queens were rulers in their own right. And what you're looking at here is the entrance to the temple of the lion-like god Apodemak. He had a lion's head and a human's body. And he took over as the primary god of ancient Egypt. He was, uh, he came in and, or not came in, but he was native to Nubia and he took precedence over Amun. And what you see on these walls are uh, King Nada Kamani and Queen Amanatori. She's the granddaughter of Amana Shiketo. They are both smiting their enemies. They're both kind of in the fey um, pose that we would have seen Narmer in. They both have clutches of enemies in their hands and deceased enemies under their feet. So here's a good diagram um, of a drawing so you can actually see what it would have looked like um, when it was maybe more painted up and had more detail to it. Um, there's a vulture flying overhead holding a Shen ring, the Shen ring of immortality. And again, this is a, um, a monitory and you can see she's not a skinny girl. And she's also, you never saw an Egyptian queen doing this. This is a Nubian queen. This is a Kandake. That was her title, um, Kandake. It's from which we get the name Candace today. So here is the queen. She's number one. It reads from left to right. So she is number one here. And then you have, so she and her husband, Amanatori, Nada Kamani, and their son, the crown prince, are paying homage to uh, Apodemak. And he, in turn, is infusing them with eternal life. These are little onks flying out of his nose into their nose. He's giving them the divine breath. And it looks as though Apodemak has three heads, but what this really is is the artist trying to show us um, Apodemic turning first to Queen Amanatori, turning to us, and then turning to look at the king and the sun. So just kind of interesting. So then after that, um, what's interesting is they continue to bury people in tombs, but this comes up to the 4th century AD towards the end of the civilization. And at this point, this is these are what are called reserved heads. And rather than having like a whole Ka statue, the reserve head acts as a replacement for the mummified body, a place for the soul should the body decay. And it's meroitic. Um, it's not a detailed portrait of the deceased. Um, it's probably sharing some of the simplified styles of works from earlier Nile cultures. Um, they do say, what's interesting, we don't know if this was meant to be a headband or a tattoo, but today in northern Sudan, newer warriors incise their brows with these identical furrows to show their bravery and strength, um, their adult status, and their ethnic identity.
So that concludes this little slideshow. And uh, what I'm going to do, whoops, at the end of this is construct an assignment around it for all of you to do um, regarding chapters two and three. So I hope this has been interesting for you and I will talk to you all very soon. Ciao for now.